Hello and welcome to part two of my series on human prehistory. This time we will be looking into the origins of the Upper Paleolithic and therewith the origins of behavioral modernity. According to a mainstream interpretation, both our species, Homo sapiens, and behavioral modernity originate in East Africa at around 200,000 years ago and 50,000 years ago respectively. There are, however, major problems with both of these views. In light of recent genetic evidence, we know that Neanderthal did interbreed with African Homo sapiens and does constitute a portion of the heritage of all non-Sub-Saharan Africans. This means that according to a biological definition, European Neanderthals and African Homo sapiens sapiens were members of a single species, and this species originated first 250,000 years ago in Europe. Our species originated in Europe and not in Africa, as is commonly thought. Likewise, the archaeological case for the origin of the Upper Paleolithic in Europe is far stronger than the case for its origin in Africa. If you read on the Wikipedia page for the Upper Paleolithic, you'll find this paragraph. About 50,000 years ago, there was a marked increase in the diversity of artifacts in Africa, bone artifacts, and the first art appear in the archaeological record. Between 45,000 years ago and 43,000 years ago, this new tool technology spread with human migration to Europe. The new technology generated a population explosion of modern humans, which is believed to have led to the extinction of the Neanderthals. There are no citations in this paragraph, and it basically puts forward the popular recent African migration hypothesis and the replacement theory for the interaction of Homo sapiens sapiens and Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. The Upper Paleolithic finds from Africa, which are vaguely being alluded to here, are really only those of the Enkapune Waimuto Cave, or the Twilight Cave, in Kenya. There are some primitive microliths and beads derived from ostrich egg shells, but these don't appear until around 40,000 years ago which is approximately 7,000 years behind the Upper Paleolithic developments in Palestine. But before we jump right into the Upper Paleolithic, I do want to back up in our timeline to around 176,000 years ago. There was actually a report that came out yesterday indicating that Neanderthal had constructed large stone rings 1,000 feet into a cave in France. This is yet further evidence that Neanderthal were more cognitively and technologically developed than we had previously thought. Around 160,000 years ago, we find the Jebel Irhud skull in Marrakesh, Morocco. When this skull was initially found, it was thought to be a Neanderthal specimen. It has since been reclassified to Homo sapiens sapiens. This neglects the possibility of early admixture. The racial stock of North Africa, for the better part of the last 150,000 years, has borne a strong resemblance to the Cro-Magnon man. The Mekta Afalo people, associated with the ibero maurigian culture, which started around 20,000 years ago, have been noted to resemble strongly Cro-Magnon populations. If this Jebel Irhud skull is indeed an early instance of admixture, that pushes back my estimate of the earliest admixture event from 130,000 years ago in Palestine to 160,000 years ago in Morocco. This makes sense geographically, since the two points on the globe at which African Homo sapiens and European Neanderthals met were Gibraltar and Palestine. From 130,000 years ago to 115,000 years ago, we have the Eemian interglacial period, during which temperatures were actually warmer than during the Holocene. This coincides with what I believe to be an initial flourishing of semi-modern behavior, as instance in the Tafralt cave in Morocco, at sites associated with the skull and Kafsa hominids in Palestine, and the site at the Blombos cave in South Africa. I briefly mentioned the notion that the skull Kafsa hominid admixture event may have spread from Palestine to influence the later Moroccan and South African developments, as well as further possible colonization events. And I did find further evidence to support the notion that the Blombos cave in South Africa was influenced by some Neanderthal admixture. The Tong child 
at the Equus Cave in South Africa from 100,000 years ago has dental morphology which more closely matches the Neanderthal than it does later Upper Paleolithic Homo sapiens. The reduction of the Neanderthal admixture in South Africa from 100,000 years ago to 70,000 years ago may indicate why the more advanced Blombos Cave techno-complex disappeared to be replaced by more primitive people. The Tafferalt Cave in Morocco, however, seems to actually be the beginnings of the Atirian industry, which lasts from 145,000 years ago all the way to 30,000 years ago in North Africa. It seems like it may begin in Morocco and move eastward across North Africa through Arabia and even as far as Pakistan. The Atirian industry used levelois or prepared core techniques, which originated with the Mosterian industry of the Neanderthal. The Atirians exploited coastal resources and practiced hafting, or the affixation of stone tips to wooden shafts. It's notable that what is often termed the early coastal migration of anatomically modern humans from Africa across India all the way into Melanesia would have been influenced by the Aterian industry. So even the first migrations of anatomically modern Homo sapiens sapiens owe their spread at least in part to interaction with Neanderthal admixed people and the tool industries which they developed. In Europe around this time, from 130,000 years ago to 70,000 years ago, we find the Mikokwian industry, which is similar to the Mosterian except it includes an asymmetrical bifacial axe. Since we do find technological developments around the same time in both Europe and North Africa, my hypothesis is that there were numerous instances of admixture, probably on both sides of Gibraltar during this time period. Both the Mycoquian and the Aterian industries are associated with cultures which had aesthetically motivated behavior and ritualistic burial. However, what we term behavioral modernity does not originate until the Upper Paleolithic. The first developments towards this are found in Palestine once again, from around 50,000 years ago with the Jabrodian culture. This is a continuous development out of the local Mysterian industry. The Mysterian utilized levelois techniques, or prepared core techniques, which allowed greater accuracy in the shaping of stone tools. The Jabrodian culture developed elongated levelois points and knives. At Boker Taktit and Kassar Akil in Palestine, we have continuous development from the late Mysterian all the way into the Emira culture of 45,000 years ago, which is the beginnings of microlithic technology, also developed in Palestine. The Jabrodian culture, the Emira culture, and even likely the Amarian culture of 43,000 years ago in Palestine all develop out of Neanderthal Mysterian industry. There was undoubtedly a high degree of African Homo sapiens admixture in these populations, but more importantly, there was a cultural continuity from earlier Neanderthal times. So these people did not perceive themselves as being replaced by an African population. They simply admixed with them and developed into a new racial stock. There are similar examples of continuous development out of Mysterian Neanderthal industries in Europe, such as the Chattelperonian and Selian cultures, of 45,000 years ago and 38,000 years ago, respectively. These used curved knives, which may have been inherited from these earlier Palestinian developments. There are, however, industries in Europe around this same time which show greater continuity with African Homo sapiens technological industries. These are the Eleusian in Italy and the Bohenician in Moravia. The Italian Eleusian industry is associated with human teeth which were analyzed and shown to bear a closer relationship with modern humans than with Neanderthals. This industry is found starting 45,000 years ago. The Boenitian industry is found 43,000 years ago and likely had some influence from the Bakokurian industry, which I will discuss in a moment. It is notable that the early Aragnation, the Bohenitian, and Selian technocomplexes coexisted for a time, indicating that not only indigenous Neanderthal developments were able to compete for several thousand years, but that several admix stocks from Palestine, possibly from North Africa as well, migrated into Europe during this time period. By the time the Arab nation began producing its famous works of art from around 40,000 years ago, it had likely absorbed genetic and technological elements 
from these other groups. But it seems that, according to the archaeological evidence, the main group of the Arig nations derives from this pattern of migration, originating from an admixed stock in Palestine, the Jabrudian culture, which was a continuation of the Neanderthal Mosterian industry. These people moved north across Anatolia into Bulgaria, and we find at the Bako Kiro cave from 46,000 years ago, evidence of precursors to Arab nation technologies. These Bako Kirian people likely picked up further Neanderthal admixture. And if my Atlantean hypothesis relating to the Carpathian Sphinx is reliable, the Bako Kirians on the south side of the Danube Valley likely had some form of influence on or influence from the Carpathian Sphinx cult. Bear in mind that is a tentative hypothesis on my part and is designed primarily simply to elucidate the possibility of breakaway human groups at an earlier time frame than we are to typically used to considering. The Bako Kyrians move up the Middle and Upper Danube, eventually reaching the Swabian Alps in southern Germany. Around 42,000 years ago, we find the first evidence of bone flutes, and these are found in several caves. And then around 40,000 years ago in the same area, we find the famous Lion Man statue, and also the Venus of Holefels. Lion Man statues and Venus figurines are going to be common during the subsequent Aragnation period. It seems that what we see here in the Swabian Alps is the coalescing of cultural and technological influences from a wide area to form the first culture province which we might recognize as being behaviorally modern. The lion has often been used symbolically as a solar figure or a Uranic figure. Venus figurines, figurines of fertility, are often associated with Chthonic cults. So already, in the initial Upper Paleolithic, we see the outlines of mythic themes which will be extrapolated for the next 40,000 years. It's interesting that just as the Arig Nation was beginning to take shape 39,300 years ago, we have the Campanian Ignimbrite eruption, a very large volcanic eruption which must have dramatically upset the way of life of at least one generation of these crucial Upper Paleolithic founders. The Arig Nation culture used bone and antler points with grooves cut in the bottom, possibly for the purpose of hafting. They likely did use spear throwers, and they used blades and bladelets from prepared cores. They had pendants, bracelets, ivory beads, and from 35,000 years ago in Germany, we find numerous animal figures. Some evidence suggests that the Arig nations did seasonally hunt reindeer, but the degree of artistic sophistication indicates to me some degree of semi-sedentarism. Although we don't have all the necessary data points to put together the full picture of the beginnings of the Upper Paleolithic, in broad outline it might be this, that starting around 150,000 years ago, Neanderthal admixture crept into the gene pool of North Africa. Around 130,000 years ago, we start seeing admix specimens in Palestine. These industries undergo a continuous development over the next 80,000 years until in Palestine, we have the first stone blade industries. From there, these people migrate north into Bulgaria and then up the Danube into Germany. Other admix groups from unknown locations also coalesce in this same region, as evinced by the Eleusian culture of Italy and the Bohanitian culture of Moravia. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend watching my An Atlantean Hypothesis video at this point and think about whether that hypothesis of the Carpathian Sphinx cult is consistent with some kind of hidden hand at work in Europe during the formation of the Upper Paleolithic. Possible, although perhaps not entirely likely. Genetic evidence suggests that our domesticated dog split from the European gray wolf around 40,000 years ago. In Belgium, we find the Goyette dog from 36,000 years ago, and as far east as the Altai Mountains, we find the Altai dog from 33,000 years ago. Asian species of domesticated dog do have ancestry from the original European stock. This supports the notion that early domesticated dogs accompanied the hunters of the Aragnation period on their seasonal migrations and eventually made it across Siberia to influence the genetic admixture of both canine and hominid groups in Asia. It seems that the Upper Paleolithic reaches Azerbaijan around 35,000 years ago 
ago, and it reaches Japan and India by 30,000 years ago. Upper Paleolithic technologies would have been far more competitive than the Middle Paleolithic technologies they came up against, and European peoples spread very rapidly from 40,000 years ago to 30,000 years ago all over Eurasia. So the early populations of China, the early populations of Japan, the early populations of Southeast Asia would have been a mix of roughly Caucasoid looking people and the early migration out of Africa along the coast. This early roughly Caucasoid East Asian population was associated with the Sundadontic dental pattern, which was associated with Austronesian peoples prior to the recent Sinicization, and associated with the Haman culture until the Korean invasion of the islands. It's interesting to note that the initial occurrence of the Upper Paleolithic in Japan features ground stone tools which are not seen elsewhere until the Neolithic. The Japanese Upper Paleolithic is very much its own culture, and further research on that development would be likely informative for those interested in the prehistory of Japan. The first ceramic sculpture is found 29,000 years ago in Moravia, and my wager is is that as time goes on, we will find further ceramic work from the Aragnation and Gravettian periods in Europe. The first ceramic wares are found in southeastern China and were not associated with Mongoloid peoples, but with this earlier East Asian, roughly Caucasoid stock, recently descended from Trans-Siberian migrants from the European Aragnation cultural province. The member of this European Trans-Siberian culture province of long-distance hunters furthest to the east was at Malta Burret, west of Lake Baikal in southern Siberia, just north of central Mongolia. The Malta Burret culture originated around 20,000 years ago, featured semi-subterranean houses made from animal bones and ivory sculptures which are similar to those of recent Siberian shaman. They also had other art which is similar to the art of the European Upper Paleolithic. The fertility figures at Malta Burret, however, often did feature faces which were absent in the European Upper Paleolithic, and it's been said that the Malta Burret population did have some mongoloid features. The Malta Burret culture was likely a large source of Native American migrants, and they belonged by and large to Y-DNA haplotype R before the R1A, R1B split. The fact that some of the ivory sculptures from Malta Burret are very similar to 18th century and 19th century Siberian shamanic sculpture is interesting because it indicates the possibility of shamanic practice from as early as 20,000 years ago. Shamanic practice likely originated from the original Upper Paleolithic men's cults. The cave paintings at Lascaux, for instance, are found within a large chamber which must be accessed via a long tunnel. Other Upper Paleolithic cave paintings are similarly hidden in deep recesses. The objects of this initial artistic tradition are invariably the animals of the herd, and they also often feature a human form which has been hypothesized to represent the shaman. The initiation into a men's rite and the transmission of shamanic knowledge may go back to as far as the Gravedian or Salutrian. Our myth still bears the signature of the rites of these early hunters, and any understanding of world mythology necessitates an understanding of this early shamanism. That falls, however, outside the scope of this presentation. I will leave the remainder of the Upper Paleolithic for the next part in this series. Thank you for listening.